Safari is the story of waves that travel thousands of miles and challenge everything in their path. Safari is also the story of surfers that travel thousands of miles to meet that challenge. Not all surfers are eager to face a 20-foot wave. Some need a little coaxing. Hey, how about my board? <laughs> about five miles north of Lanada, hundreds of surfers and spectators have gathered at the Redondo Breakwater. Most surfers have never even seen surf this size, much less try to ride it. Storm surf at Redondo, and every surfer for miles around headed for the breakwater. Unlucky Charlie got the word, but he should have stayed home. Unlucky Charlie's brother should have stayed home, too. Surfers will talk about this big December day at Redondo for years and brag about their perfect ride. There were a lot of perfect rides. Surfer challenged wave and wave challenged surfer. No doubt this day will be remembered as one of the most dramatic in California surf history. Safari begins as we join two surfers heading out of the city to pick up their girlfriends and enjoy a day of surfing. The 1967 International Surf Champion is Ricky Grigg, a scholarship student. His friend John Teague is also a student and an outstanding surfer. It was about 50 years ago that the great Duke Kahanamoku introduced the art of surfing to Southern California. In the past 20 years, it has mushroomed from a few surfers scattered along the coast to a major sport now enjoyed by millions. Surfing has grown by leaps and bounds, primarily because it's such a fun sport. But it has its practical sides, too. Each year, surfers are credited with preventing hundreds of drownings. Inexperienced swimmers swept out to sea by riptides are not uncommon along our coast.
surfboards have been found to be the most practical way for rescues offshore. Most surfers have developed a healthy respect and appreciation for the sea. Whoever this guy in trouble is, he obviously is not a surfer. I've heard about those all-night parties on boats, but uh, isn't this carrying it a little bit too far? Well, he's probably just smuggling another bag of Acapulco gold to the Mafia. John thinks maybe a cup of his day-old instant coffee might fix him up. They quickly found out that the young Frenchman's jumping ship was no accident at all. He had planned for years to see California, and when he got his chance, he took it. He figures even if the immigration authorities do catch him and send him back, well, it'll still be worth the chance. John suddenly remembered the girls are waiting for them. Well, that young Frenchman seemed like a neat enough guy. <laughs> but who will believe a ridiculous story like that? Especially Rick and John's girlfriends who've been waiting for over an hour. Rincon is one of the best surfing spots along the California coast, located just south of Santa Barbara. It's a point break and has one of the best shapes and longest rides to be found in California. Surfing has its own code of ethics. Uh, watch what happens when a young surfer drops in front of Cooper. Oh, a kook. Ah, good boy, Cooper. Wipe him out. Man, that Bob Cooper sure got this place wired. Let's go out. I think we have time for just, just how about that 360? Well, it was a good day at Rincon, and Rick and John are reluctant to leave, but there was a little matter that Rick and John had promised to teach the girls to surf. And, of course, the contest this afternoon. Cruising down the coast, the guys were having a rough time convincing the girls that they really rescued a young Frenchman. Well, you can't win them all. It's getting tougher and tougher to be a hero these days. Hey, look. Here's a break. <laughs> now maybe the girls will believe them. Rick figured they might as well give the guy a lift as far as Malibu. At least he wouldn't get pneumonia, you know. The young Frenchman told the gang his name was Mike Benet, but somehow Frenchy seemed more appropriate. <laughs> Miss Natural Resources welcomes our gang. Sometimes Malibu gets pretty crowded, but luckily today there's hardly anyone out. Surfing on the west coast more or less started and grew up on this beach. More surfers, including Ricky, have learned to surf here than at any other spot. When Ricky was nine years old, Buzzy Trent took him out here at Malibu for a tandem ride. After a few blast-offs and splashdowns, Ricky was hooked. Only a few years ago, the old-timers were riding the big hollow paddle boards and the heavy redwood planks, and a little later, the slightly lighter balsa boards. 
But today we see the water jam with the more maneuverable lightweight foam boards. <laughs> Frenchie had never seen anything like it. You know, if a complete history of West Coast surfing is ever written, it will take the first chapter just to list the characters whose names are synonymous with Malibu. Guys like Simmons, Quig, Velzy, Rockland, James, Maury, <laughs> Tube Steak and Gidget. Then there was Weber, Alberg, Carson, Lyndon Ford, Fane, and of course, the number one cat of Malibu, Mickey Dora. Some of the old salts will have you believe Malibu is ruined forever with the invasion of the thousands of young Grammys. But one consolation, if you do make a mistake, forget it. It won't be noticed. Wake up, wake up! Ow! This has just got to be the best ride of the day. With the introduction of the new lightweight surfboards, it was only natural that new styles of surfing would develop. Dewey Weber is credited with developing the style that has become known as the hot dog. Performing on a wave was considered revolutionary. Dewey's nose rides and tricks were quickly imitated. Getting the most out of every wave was the new style that made Dewey the king of the hot doggers. Speaking of styles, this fiberglass jungle was also the birthplace of the topless style. But hardly anyone even noticed. There are many little spots nearby that are less crowded. Let's check out this one and give the girls a few surf lessons. Although surfing has become very competitive, many of the old timers will tell you it was more fun in the good old days when surfing was more of a social get together. Teaching a pretty girl can be fun, especially if she likes to go tandem. Paddling and waxing are fundamental steps. Now let's go out and try a few. Frenchie seemed to be enjoying his newfound friends, but he isn't so sure about the surfing sticks, as he called them. Ah, uh, what guy doesn't like to show off a little to his girlfriend? Rick, of course, is much more at home in the Big Island surf, but John really digs these little California curls. John does a neat little cheater five and pulls out when the wave starts the section. Rick thinks a headstand might impress Sue. <laughs> if this ride ever becomes popular, we might name it an El Reverso Cheater 10 Finger Head Dip. <laughs> Who the heck names these rides anyway? Frenchy was going out of his guard. Sue thought she'd give it a try. Who knows, maybe she too can do an L reverso. Teague's getting warmed up for the contest. Well, Sue's not exactly breaking the sound barrier. Come on, Sue, do an El Reverso. That's more of a reverse spasimoto. Actually, it was a good first try. Frenchie's ridden belly boards in France, but never a surfboard, and there's quite a difference. Steady. Five, four, three, two, one, blast off. Well, he didn't quite get into orbit. This time, Rick told Frenchie to shift his weight back on the launch pad, and he took off like a V2 rocket. Only this V2 doesn't have retro fire, and he's in trouble. Fortunately, Frenchie bailed out in time, but the spacecraft got a small thing.
Frenchie wanted to pay for the board, but Ricky told him no sweat. After all, what's a little ding? When the surf boom rocked California, surf shops sprang up all along the coast. Dale Velzi was one of the first and largest of the board makers. Rick asked Chowdown Charlie, where's Dale? Chowdown says he's out back working hard. Yep, there's old Dale slaving away. Rick and John have got a split for the contest. Velzi says let Frenchie stick around. He'll bring him over in half an hour. It takes a lot of hard work to shape a good custom board. Today's average surfboard costs well over 100 bills. Velzi's not only a top board designer, but he's also got other hobbies as well. Right now, he's going to try out his new dune buggy. According to Dale, a dune buggy gives you the same thrill as taking off on a giant wave at 50 miles an hour. Let's watch. scheme of his own. Oh, well, there wasn't much business today anyway. And a good cut back that time by Donald Takayama. Ricky Gregg is taking off outside. He makes a good drop turn. Contests haven't been too popular in California until the last few years. Of course, the larger prizes today help. There are more than 500 entries here today in all divisions. But it's not just the competition or the prizes, it's the fun. The chance to see old friends and meet a few new ones. Skipper Fats likes to make new friends. <laughs> you can't win them all, Skipper. Well, that's the end of the men's semifinals. I think you'll agree, ladies and gentlemen, we're seeing today some of the world's finest surfers. Donald Takayama did well. Rick Young had several outstanding rides, and so did Jackie Baxter. It's too early to make any predictions, but Rick Gregg looked awfully good in that heat. The Wind and Sea Surf Club has certainly been well represented here today. Their club is very well organized. The women's semifinals will be run next. We have seen some amazing talent here today. Wow! <laughs> Now, while the girls are getting ready for their event, let's take the mic over and meet the judges. Our first judge, Dana Williams, representing Gordon and Smith Surf Shop, and Greg Noe from his own surf shop, and from Manhattan Beach, representing Rick Surfboards, Rick Stoner, and for Bing Surfboards, Bing Copeland. Well, there's the start of the women's event. Linda Benson on a fast takeoff, straightens off. Man, look at Linda handle that suit.
Upside now, Joyce Hoffman dropping in. A little late and straightens off. Uh-oh, you missed a good wave, Joyce. Nancy Nelson and Robin Calhoun take off. Nancy pulls back and Robin takes it. But the wave mushes and Robin rides out the suit. Outside, Nancy Nelson in a late takeoff. Nancy makes her drop, but she slipped. Oh, that was a tough break for Nancy. Way out to the left now. Joyce Hoffman is dropping in. She trims, grabs a rail. Oh, oh, a section. Joyce grabs again, grabbing the rail. What a ride. That was one of the finest rides we've seen here today. It's surfing like that that have made Joyce a world champion. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give the girls a good hand. Junior men, you may enter the water. Junior men, you have approximately 10 minutes in your heat. Good luck. I see the dance has started. If you'd like to join in, you might move over to the dance. I guess no contest is complete without a dance. Hey, Penn Sue's cousin Diane. Frenchie whispers something to Sue. He wants a little private conference. Could be he wants to be fixed up with Sue's cousin. Well, <laughs> who doesn't? Let's move up and check some of the local talent. Some of the cats are out of sight. It's too crowded, you can always double up and go tandem. Teams, you may enter the water. Frenchy struck out. Sue gives him the bad word that Diane is hung up on some cat. Say la vie, Frenchy. Mike Doyle and Linda Merrill are heavy favorites to win the tandem event. There's a good set coming, and Mike and Linda are taking the first wave. Boy, they're not wasting any time. Looked like they were in trouble. Good ride, beautiful ride, and a beautiful wave there. Surf seems to be picking up quite a bit. Right up to the beach. Beautiful. Two teams taking off. Looks like they're in trouble. I believe the team in the front is trying for an El Squato Moto. But Bob Moore tops it with an El Splasho. No, miraculously, never say die. Bob makes a beautiful recovery. What a ride. Mike Doyle and Linda Merrill are performing a one-foot forward swan. A fantastic ride. They're taking advantage of the white water to do some tricks. It's easy to see why Mike and Linda have won every major contest with their expert rides. Looks like they've got another sure winner here today. Boy, that Mike and Linda is something else. Maybe next year we'll have a contest for surf knots. Let's rejoin the gang now. It's about chow time. Frenchie's out checking some of the local action. Sidewalk surfing or skateboarding started in California. John tries his luck on one and finds it a great deal like real surfing, also like skiing.
Many names of surf rides have been adopted, such as the Quasimodo here. And the coffin. Here's an L headache, or whatever we call it. Rick says, let's eat. Now there's a skeg for you. One of the happiest characters on the surf scene is a young guy known as Stubby. Stubby's one of those rare people that everyone likes, especially hungry surfers. Stubby's running a special during the contest, all the spaghetti you can eat for 89 cents. So since you'll go busted with this crowd. Here he comes with another load. Maybe he's trying to louse up this contest. Here comes Greg Knoll, one of the judges. He gives Rick a warm handshake. Oh, it was warm, all right. A handful of hot spaghetti. Here comes Rick Young and John Cormack, an Australian surfer. John Cormack, he just got off the boat. He's a pretty hot Australian surfer. Don, I like it. I mean, Pam, John, Sue, and Ricky. All right. Hi, John. Do that in Hawaii. We sure did. Sit down. Go on. How about some cokes? Here, I'll grab a couple. Thanks. Last time we met, you were telling me about Australian, sir. We never did get that finish, did we? No. When you come down to Australia, I don't think you'll find us quite as far behind as you may think. We're very proud of our thousands of beautiful beaches that completely surround Australia. Say, John, what do you do about all the sharks down there? Our best protection is the excellent work that our volunteer lifesavers do. Not only do these men not receive pay, but they hold surf carnivals during the summer to raise funds to buy the necessary life-saving equipment. Newspapers tend to sensationalize the shark attacks. Most of the victims are usually swimmers, not surfboard riders. Actually, I only know of three or four surfboard riders who have been attacked. When a shark is spotted, the shark lines are sounded and the surfboats take to the water to chase the shark out of the area. During the summer when there are many swimmers on the beach, surfboards are restricted to certain areas. If a surfer is caught in the swimming area, he can lose his board for the entire season. Even a lifesaver can be distracted from his work. Around Sydney, we have good surf about seven months of the year. Our big surf starts around May or June, which is our winter down under. Yeah, John, I've heard that when the surf does come up down under, everyone heads for the beach just about any way they can get there. It takes a few days after the storm for the surf to form up. But some of the guys just can't wait.
Bernard Midget Fowley is considered Australia's top surfer. His ability was proven when he won the International Surfing Championships in Hawaii. Incidentally, he was the first Australian to win the world's title. By the way, John, what kind of boards are the hot surfers like Midget riding today in Australia? Well, at one stage, we were behind in our surfboard industry, but in recent years, the quality of the surfboard has picked up tremendously, and the surfboards are comparable to any other board in the world. Up till a few years ago, we were using the 16-foot hollow plywood board, which are very hard to maneuver. But today, we're using the light polyurethane foam surfboard. Our boards are double layer fiberglass, just like yours, but a little cheaper. As a matter of fact, quite a bit cheaper. We even ship a few boards as far away as South Africa. By the way, Rick, when you come over, don't forget we drive on the left-hand side of the road. One of the unique spots on the Gold Coast is around the Surface Paradise area. At one spot, when there's a good swell running, rides can be had from a mile to a mile and a quarter. The midget surfs in this area quite often. One of my favorite spots in the surface paradise area is a place called Corumban. As the swells push in over the shallow sandy bottom, they wrap around the big rock and form into paper thin walls. On a good south swell, you get beautifully shaped waves. These little walls really give you a chance to improve your footwork. One thing for sure, any American surfer will get a warm welcome when he comes to Australia. Poor Stubby, it looks like the chow hogs are honking down their tenth plate of spaghetti. At least it will keep them out of trouble. Oh, <laughs> will it? Stubby, you had better haul out the tranquilizers. It's too late. Nothing like a little clean fun. <laughs> Poor Stubby. If you're wondering who won, it was Sammy. He ate 12 plates. Stubby says, to heck with getting rich. Let's go see the chicks. Our bathing suit contest is just about to get underway. Our judges are busy checking their vital statistics and phone numbers. The girls are a little nervous. So are the boys. <laughs> Our first contestant, Miss Carol Lane. Carol is so nervous, even her bathing suit has goosebumps. Miss Marcia Boehner. Marcia is from the South Bay. How'd you like to wax her board? From Canoga Park, Pam Douglas. Pam is another winner. They're all winners. Pam doesn't seem too nervous, but I wonder how Teague is making it. I think I'll turn in my surfboard for girls. And next, Miss Sandra Crawford. Sandra hails from Manhattan Beach. Some of the guys are really scarfing up this contest. And Miss Linda Heal. Here comes Miss Christine Ewart of Torrance. The girls are being judged by points. It's hard to tell who's ahead.
speaking of heads, this one is out of sight. Steady, boys. The next contestant is Miss Diane Charles. Wow. Some of the fellows are trying to pull a few strings. Well, that's a good trick if you can pull it off. Our next contestant is a young lady from Pasadena, Miss Joanne Black. Let's take a pause for the cause and find out what happened to Frenchie. Seems he's got his own contest going. Actually, Frenchie's cool. He's just trying to promote a little international relations. Now, here's something pretty wild. For $15, you get a quick course on how to win friends and influence people. In only three weeks, you can learn to be a 98-pound concrete block. The course starts with three ways to die gracefully. If he misses, you get a refund. Some of the large contests even have night surf carnivals and demonstrations. With almost a thousand contestants, it might take several days to complete the contest. If the surf drops, it might take a week. Malibu's team is leading in points right now. The Taplin race is a marathon of dory races, swimming, and surfing. It takes both ability and endurance with teamwork to win one of these races. Most of the participants in these demonstrations are lifeguards. No one seems to mind the chilly water. Well, almost no one. And here comes Mike Doyle. This young man has done a fantastic job tonight. Well, that's it for tonight. See you early in the morning. Well, this is the big day. <laughs> Nothing like a good, wholesome breakfast to start the day off right. The next uh, heat of the men's finals will be our last event. Some guys think wax is for sissies, but a slip in this event could cost a contestant valuable points and maybe even a free trip to the islands. Our audience has been well over 20,000. We wish to thank the many contestants and visitors Speaking of visitors, or is he a contestant? Maybe he's a spy. The surf has dropped some, but there is a trip to the islands to the winner. Well, they're off and running. Richards, Fane, and Irons taking off. L.J. Richards of Oceanside hesitates, looks around. He's taking it, walks up, trims. L.J.'s cool. He stays with it. L.J. cranks a really smooth turn. Outside, a nice set. And from San Diego's Wind and Sea Surf Club, Skip Fry, driving hard into a nice little wave. Skip's really casual and cool. These men are scored on control, performance, judgment, number of waves caught, and aggressiveness. In short, getting the most out of each wave. Outside, John Teague and Ricky Gregg taking off. John pulls back. Rick makes a drop turn. Maneuvers into position. Oh, oh, a section. Rick squats through, grabs the rail, and plows through. Wow, he made it. That's where experience counts. Rick is certainly an aggressive surfer. Near the end of the pier, Rick Irons squats through a beautiful tunnel. And outside, Mike Doyle with a no paddle takeoff. Walks up, sees a section, and straightens off. And a nice reverse kick out. Ricky Gray drops left, walks up, trims. Makes his way through a little section. Man, Rick is sure getting the most out of these little waves. Inside, John Teague turns left, walks up, looks back. Oh, he almost was hit by a board. That was close. John runs up to the nose, and the wave mushes out. But he is still working it. John looks pretty disgusted. And a good kick out. It's pretty hard to do much in that suit. Ricky sure trying hard. A set coming outside, and someone is grabbing the first wave, heading into disaster. Ow! Oh, that one hurt. He loses points on that one. Someone's grabbing the second wave. It's Rick Irons. 
That one hurt, too. Well, that's it. It's all over, but adding up the points. All contestants in the finals, please report to the official platform for the awards presentation. Our first award is the Special Duke Kahanamoku Trophy for event participation. The trophy is being presented by the Duke, and it goes to Mike Doyle. And for best sportsmanship, Ricky Young of Dapper Dance. Second place is a tie between Dewey Weber and Jackie Baxter. Third place is John Kemper. And now for our first place awards, I turn the mic over to our friend Stubby. Everybody, hold it down. We now have the winner of the bikini contest. It is a rough one this time. And the winner is... <laughs> Diane! Let's give her a hand. There's your trophy and your ticket. <laughs> I'm a winner, too. <laughs> Let's give her a hand, all right? Now, the winner of the senior men's division, plus a round trip ticket to Hawaii, is... Big Greg! Come on up, Greg. Let's give him a hand, all right? Come on. So here's your trophy for winning, and here's your tickets to the islands. We hope you have a good time, all right? Let's give him a hand. Come on. Well, friends, Ricky Greg is a lucky guy. My thanks to Stubby for his help. Hey, where are you guys going with Stubby? Well, everyone can't win. Survival in the big surf in Hawaii requires a special design board called a big gun. Rick and Greg should know. They're the two top cats in big surf. But would you believe these two? Sometimes I wonder about that contest. John and Pam are seeing Rick, Sue, and Frenchie off to the islands. Rick has lived in the islands and has relatives there, which makes everything cool. You know, in just four hours and a hundred beans, you can safari to paradise. Hawaii is a group of islands and coral reefs extending 1,600 miles in the central Pacific. But only seven of these islands are inhabited. Giant storms come exploding down from the Bering Sea, pounding the north side of the islands. Along the north shore of Oahu were the best big wave hunting grounds in the world. Each year during the storm season, hundreds of big wave hunters from around the world safari here with their big guns. She is greeted with the traditional lay. Hawaii is a land of yesteryear, yet modern. Waikiki is probably the most famous tourist area in the world. Looks like good time Frenchie is going native. In the background, every geography teacher will readily recognize this world famous landmark, Mount Fujiyama. Nature is blessed to Hawaii with year-round sun and natural beauty. For the non-surfer, a rent-a-canoe is fun. All ages enjoy fun in the sun. The credit card set prefer the outriggers. Many of the locals still surf in the old style. To a newcomer with bread, a rented instructor is the best plan. And for those on economy budget plan, the local Chamber of Commerce provides free swim lessons from three to five daily. <laughs> they had to discontinue this plan. It was crushing the waves. For all of us with a no budget plan, let's head out Kamehameha Highway to Sunset Beach. At Sunset Beach each year, the top 25 surfers from around the world are invited to compete in the Duke Kahanamoku contest for the international championship. Ricky Grigg recently won the 1967 title with 29 more points than anyone had ever before received. A mile offshore, sunset is breaking, and breaking hard. Most big wave riders consider sunset the best surfing spot in the world.
ironically more California surfers than Hawaiians safari to the North Shore for the World Series of Surfing. A wipeout at sunset can mean a long, dangerous swim. Sue introduces Frenchie to surf photographer Don Brown. Checking outside, Don spotted Rick really turning on. Don pointed out to Sue and Frenchie how a few years ago just making waves this size was considered an accomplishment. The main emphasis has been on speed. When Ricky began performing spinners on the giant sunset peaks, it started a whole new concept of big wave riding. The popular pintail-shaped surfboard had speed but lacked maneuverability. Ricky felt the board must go where you want it to go. More functional boards were designed and the modern trend was set. A strong cone of wind and a wave like this present problems even for Rick. After the drop, watch Rick stall and wait for the curl. As it catches up, Rick trims and steps forward for a little more speed. Watch now as Rick spots a giant boil and heads for disaster. Another surfer heads for disaster. Tourists on Rena buses with Rena binoculars are startled to see men and boards pulverized. Attention all passengers, please turn in your glasses and return to your seats. Your three minutes are up now, wasn't that fun? Well, they'll never believe it back in Wichita anyway. But not all the spectators were tourists. Little Jeff Hackman observed past masters like Fred Van Dyke. Fred was surfing before Jeff was even born. Jeff is the quiet observant type. His eager mind absorbed the critical drop, the air of taking off and getting trapped like Ricky Grigg here, and the wisdom of Ricky's quick pronoun to avoid a long swim. Frenchie wanted to try out his new pipo board. Both Frenchie and Jeff can learn a lot from Paul Gebauer. Jeff admired Paul's exceptionally smooth style. Maybe, just maybe, he'd be able to ride like that someday. Jeff's curiosity was so great he had to try it. When Jeff first paddled out at sunset, he was 14 and weighed only 89 pounds soaking wet. Those waves must have looked like mountains to Jeff. From his first day in Big Surf, it was obvious Jeff Hackman's natural ability far exceeded his small stature. A new giant was born. Hackman, no doubt, will be added to the list of all-time giants at sunset, like Trent, Curran, Downing, Cole, and, of course, the undisputed master of sunset, Ricky Grigg. Ricky has described dropping down the face of sunset as similar to the feeling a skier might experience being chased down a mountainside by an avalanche. Ricky and Jeff share a wall with Frenchy. Frenchy and his new belly board caused grave concern, but under Ricky's watchful eye, Frenchy began handling the big waves like a pro. Rusty Miller gets a classic wall. Out of nowhere comes Frenchy on his out of control Batma board. His unscheduled go behind unnerved Rusty. Rusty took one look at this snub nosed bat gun and climbed over the wall. Frenchy's control left a lot to be desired, but his speed was phenomenal. Greg Knoll and Sue shared Frenchy's happiness in becoming part of the surf scene. Midget Farley and some of the barefoot rebels from Australia have safaried 6,000 miles to enjoy this surfer's paradise. Out of the whole world, it seems nature has chosen the 12 miles along the north shore of Oahu is the perfect retreat for big wave hunters. Late in the afternoon, some of the surfers unwisely stayed out until almost dark. This can be very dangerous because the surfer is tired and the long afternoon shadows make the waves difficult to judge. Paul Gabara makes his last ride across the steep inside wall and wisely heads for home. The ghost rider came in. 
But Rusty Miller stays out too long and runs into a little trouble. This pair made it the hard way. Hey, Charlie, get out of the way. Charlie, let go. Charlie. <laughs> too bad about Charlie. But Charlie had the last laugh. Watch as one surfer loses control and buries his board in the back of his ex-buddy. Well, it was a great day at sunset, but Bob Cloutier stayed out so long he had to bounce home by radar. Rick and Sue are checking a few of the Rolls Royces. Looks like Terry Blevins has heard about a new surfing spot, or maybe he's in trouble. He jumps in his chauffeur-driven gold-plated Cadillac and takes off. The truth is, Terry forgot to make car payments number two, three, four, and, <laughs> well, you get the idea. Some of the more dangerous beaches on the North Shore are off limits to servicemen. Corporal Belinsky tried out his air mattress and won a Purple Heart. If the swell goes down, there's always fun things to do. Skin boards are fun if you don't break your back. After it rains, sliding down a little waterfall is also fun. Since there had been a lot of rain lately, a small safari headed up to Waimea Falls. That should really be fun. The trouble is, no one was sure about the bottom. So Tom went down to check the bottom. He didn't come up, so Bill Bragg went down to check the bottom. Bill didn't come up. So Dick went down to find the bottom. He found the bottom. A little safari off the beaten path brings us to a spot called Velzee Land. Velzee Land has an extremely sharp coral bottom, as Barry Kaniapuni finds out. But not even a broken arm can discourage Mickey Ghost. The only problem is the cast got waterlogged and almost drowned him. The sharp coral bottom and coral caves have cost the lives of several surfers. Barry Kaniapuni has the place so wired that many surfers in respect to Barry refuse to enter the water when he's out. Barry's fan club really admires his natural ability, but others feel if you can't beat him, wipe him out. Ricky Griggs' love and understanding of the sea goes much deeper than surfing. His uncanny perception and performance on a wave is partly the result of his scientific approach and years of study. Like most surfers, Ricky has a more serious side to his life. He's currently a scholarship student working for his PhD in oceanography. Rick was lucky enough to be one of the aquanauts who worked with Scott Carpenter in the underwater Sea Lab 2 experiment. When there is no surf, Ricky goes down and checks for shipwreck treasures or for rare scientific specimens. He's just discovered a choice scientific specimen which is classified as a decapid crustacean of the genus Homeridae. <laughs> Translated, that means lobster. And that means good eating any way you translate it. I like Ricky's scientific approach to reducing the chow bill. Lobster is a real delicacy. Barbecued octopus. Hey, you guys want some octopus? We left. 
To me, Hawaii's natural beauty and relaxed atmosphere are unequaled anywhere in the world. There are many miles of unpopulated beaches for fishing or just relaxing. But don't get too relaxed. Near Sunset Beach is a fun sandy bottom shore break called Pupakea. Three surfers check out the action. Steve Angus thought it looked lousy, but Ricky Young from Manhattan Beach could see beautiful possibilities. So Rick went out. Interesting thing about Pupakea, you can ride in three directions. Either right, left, or straight down. If the wave gets too crowded, Rick takes the high road and Fred Hemmings takes the low road. Fred moves up but gets snuffed down. Fred is without a question one of the finest surfers in the world today. Watch him hang five and go into a body surf right off his board. It looked fun, so Greg Abbott from San Diego tries it. Hey, it does work. No more of that greasy kid stuff for Greg. Greg's cousin, Larry Lumbach, is the hottest body surfer around. His windmills and body actions are classic. Hawaiian girls are world famous for their natural beauty and friendliness. But this friendly typhoid Mary is about as popular on the North Shore as an unwed mother at a PTA meeting. The most radical spot on the North Shore, and probably in the whole world, is the Banzai Pipeline. Some adventurous souls like Australia's Mick McMahon will try the impossible just to see if it really is impossible. <laughs> and it is. Greg Knoll finds the pipeline has a very shallow bottom. <laughs> but 10 minutes later, he's right back up. For anyone hell-bent on Harry Carey, Bonsai Pipeline is the perfect place. But every surfer must try it at least once. day, there's still only about a half a dozen surfers who can really handle the pipeline. Steve Gaines has become one of the best. Butch Van Artsdale has earned the name Mr. Pipeline. Butch says it's easy. You make a drop turn in midair, speed up to 120 miles an hour, do a switch foot, crank a smart turn, trim, then walk up to the nose and you've got the wave made. Let's see, would you mind repeating that, Butch? 
Drop in at 117 miles per hour, do a smart uh, move up. Easy, he says. Forget it. But even an expert like Butch can make a mistake. The problem was he took off at only 96 miles an hour. Greg Noll has been waiting outside and grabs an all-time ride. Fantastic. Hawaii is well known throughout the world for its near-perfect climate. And the miles of pineapple and sugar cane fields are a testimony to Hawaii's booming economy. But the U.S. Weather Bureau is reporting a giant storm is headed this way. An urgent effort is being made to harvest the pineapple crop before the impending storm. once described Hawaii as the loveliest fleet of islands anchored in any ocean. Indeed it is. Trying to relax is almost impossible when you know soon you may be facing the largest wave of your life. Less than a half dozen surfers have ever faced a 30-foot wave. Perhaps more than the threatening danger and challenge, the waiting is the toughest part. Waiting. Waiting. Ironically, it was during the Ice Age that Hawaii arose from the sea like the jolly green giant. Once, the Weather Bureau correctly prognosticated the storm surf. A pot of gold is waiting for anyone crazy enough to meet the challenge. Twice in the past 10 years, an enormous wall rose out of the sea about a mile out from Bonsai Pipeline. Naturally, no one had ever ridden the thing. To be sure, suicide. Kimo and Butch thought it was a bad dream. Kimo's group had 21% fewer dings. Sue was trying to patch Rick's trunks. Then Greg Knoll arrived with his board, but of course he hadn't seen the thing. Rick went over to tell Greg to forget the board, but then they started talking. He's looking at a set coming outside. What do you think, Greg? Can you get out? It's a hell of a set. I don't know if we're going to make it past that short break or not. Come on, let's try it. I think we can get out if we get over here. See, I still think the best bet would be get somebody up on the hill spotting for us and then wait, you know, wait for a good roll and then go, huh? Okay, I'm ready. Just look at the set coming outside. Take a look at that size of that thing. 25. Close to it. Hey, here comes Sting. Maybe he's going to go out with us. What do you think? Mike? Hey, you want to go? Come on, come on. You ready? Yeah. All right. A couple of Malahinis couldn't believe anyone was crazy enough to try and ride this place. Watching Mike wax up, one of them said, Hey, Jack, what are those guys putting on their boards? I don't know. Rick lost the toss and had the dubious honor to be the first one to try to get out. It looked impossible, but there had to be a channel. Finally, there was a slight lull and Ricky launched. He had plotted a course of attack, but within the first 50 feet, the cross current was taking him off course. Greg and Mike waited for the inevitable. Paddling hard, Rick plowed over the first wave just in time. Frenchy tried to reassure Sue, but the inevitable happened. Not once, but four times. Correction, that makes five inevitables. Ricky is the most determined surfer I've ever known. His reaction is curiosity, not fear. Greg and Stang moved down a newly formed sandbar to a more advantageous launch spot. Two days ago, they'd been surfing over the exact spot where they're now walking. Outside, 
Rick looks down the vertical drop and pulls back. The board follows. Inside, Greg and Stang launch. They picked their course and railroaded for it. Charlie Galando couldn't stand the suspense. He joined them. Stang climbed up, took one look, and fainted. Charlie Galando tested the inside reef. Hanging high in the wave, he blazed a trail across the flat section, never knowing when or where the bottom would suddenly drop out. Feeling his way across the endless wall, he felt a surge upward. He tried to climb, but the wall was getting steep. Desperately, he lunged for the top. As it turned out, it was a very wise decision. Galento's stock jumped up 10 points. Stang was testing the shoulder. Then Rick gambles a do or die drive right down the heart of the wave. Rick works his way back high on the wall, but one glance tells him pulling out would be disastrous. Another killer wave close behind leaves him no choice but to ride it out. Rick makes an island pull out and races back outside in time to see Charlie Galento screaming across the top of a hairy wall. Charlie powers over just in time. There is no question Charlie has guts, but storm surf with the force of an atomic bomb makes the odds a little uneven. Rick, confident from his first ride, calmly drops into an even larger wave. If any awards are given out for keeping a cool head, Rick should get it. Watch as he calmly trims his board just inches ahead of the giant curl. Suddenly the wave plays out and Rick is left to face the menacing shore break. He calmly waits until the last possible second and tries to plow over. He couldn't make it. Galento literally fights his way over the top of another monster. Rick, happy to be alive, makes a quick change in the poor man's Waldorf Hilton. <laughs> Zippers can really hang you up. Galento decides to hang it up. A whole wave closed out behind him. It's a long swim for Galento and a warm reception for Rick. But what about Greg and Stang? In five hours outside, Greg Knoll still has not made his move. Stang is standing by Greg waiting. Waiting. Waiting for that ultimate wave. Someone screamed, outside. And there it was. Greg Knoll on a wall a mile long. With no hope of escape, Greg screams across the seething onslaught of hungry fury, knowing that at any second he will be devoured alive. That is unbelievable. Let's watch a slow motion instant replay of the last part of that harrowing ride again to see just what happened. Greg, with his feet far apart for maximum stability, is driving far ahead of the giant comber. He wants out, but there is no out. The feathering top lip of the wave has entrapped him down inside. In spite of his fantastic speed, the whole world is closing in on him. Just ahead, the steep upthrust catapults Greg into space. There. And the green monster eats him alive. Follow his board now as it reverses course up through the wave and goes into orbit. A 50-pound elephant gun floating through space like a feather. Somehow, Greg survived and swam ashore. Outside pipeline is definitely something else. There was no real pot of gold or even blue chip stamps but I know four brave surfers who feel a whole lot richer inside. Frenchy gave Rick a letter from Teague and some of the guys back in California. Since they couldn't make the safari to sunny Hawaii, they took a ski safari to the not-so-sunny mountains. John says the slopes look like a busy day at Malibu. Some red-blooded Americans like the sport of surfing and some like the sport of skiing, but there's one sport that we all like, girls. The trouble with skiing is you're never sure what they look like. Here's one that really needs help. Help! 
Actually, she lost her contact lens. But surfers don't need help. After all, if you can stand up on a slippery surfboard, you should be able to stand up on slippery skis. Oh, boy. Surfing seems to develop strong arms and shoulders, and skiing seems to develop strong legs. Notice the strong legs. Dave Rockland was a little short of money, so he only rented one ski. With a private ski instructor, you can learn to ski in a few lessons, but ski instructors are a little expensive, so Tommy Raines bought a 10-cent do-it-yourself manual and learned all by himself. boy, Tommy. Skiing has some funny rules about paying $3 to ride the ski toe to the top of the hill. Robert didn't have $3 so they shortened Robert's skis. Didn't bother Robert much, though, because they were rented skis. Actually, the joke was on them, because short skis are more fun anyway. Some of the ski outfits are too much. <laughs> so are some of the wipeouts. The booby prize for the best wipeout of the day will just have to go to this modern Robinson Crusoe. Some of the kids having such a good time gave the surfers an idea for a new game. They borrowed a few old inner tubes off a few old cars and invented a new sport. Every sport should have a name, so they named this one El Rupcho. Watching an expert ski down a fresh powder is a beautiful sight. But even experts make mistakes. John says skiing is great fun, but he thinks he'll stick to surfing. Back in sunny Hawaii, the storm has almost closed out the whole North Shore, and now the swell is shifting towards Waimea Bay. The main reef has not yet started breaking, but the stage is set for a dramatic day. Waiting outside was easier for some. Others waited inside. Rick and Sue found building sandcastles an easy way of waiting. She noticed the whole bay was vibrating. Maybe it isn't the storm vibrating the bay. Looks like Wanda the Wahini Watusi Wonder Girl has heard about the French lovers and wants to start a meaningful relationship. She almost started a tidal wave.
the hill, we see the deep water swells approaching land at approximately 30 miles an hour. Let's take this wave. The lineup is crowded, but easy. You scratch, then feel the lift up, power down. You're startled by how fast the wave develops. You look around, amazed you're in the slot. You trim, regain your composure, and feel the warm spray nudging you on. Well, you rode the bay, and it's a great feeling until you remember it might get three times this size. Rick was in no hurry to go out. Never before had so many big wave hunters crowded the lineup for the big challenge. Even the first sets are peaking at 16 feet and showing excellent shape. By 1.30, the surf had picked up to around 18 feet. Four on a wall is a little ridiculous, but knowing how quickly the size and mood of Waimea can change, some of the surfers are getting in all the rides they can. About two o'clock, Greg Knoll, the Pied Piper of the bay, went out. Don James with camera paddled out for the channel. And to everyone's amazement, little Jeff Hackman was going out. The main reef is now peaking at a steady 20 feet. The thickly shaped wave looks tame, but it's deceptively steep. But even to a seasoned pro like Greg Knoll, a spectacular vertical wall can mean a terrible wipeout. It's funny to some guys when a heavy takes gas, but you don't get to be top cat at YMA without a lot of hard knocks. Frenchie watched helplessly as Greg's big gun smashed into the rocks. Watching a $200 gun get demolished is a sad experience. And the shocking realization of just how quickly the fragile human body can also be demolished sort of makes you stop and think. Fortunately, Greg's gun survived the grueling test. Hey, Greg, how's the bottom? Go take a flying what? Sue doesn't want Ricky to go out, but it's getting great out there, and Greg and Stang are going out, and then forget it. Sue doesn't grasp the deep meaning Waimea has to a heavy like Rick. Experience has taught Rick a pronoun is better than a swim any day. For a moment, Rick disappears in the soup and then comes out grinning from ear to ear. Greg and Stang spring out of the green wall and are joined by Professor Peter Cole. Notice how Greg's speed bounced him. Stang gets the same treatment. Rick drops in between two goofy foots. Sammy Lee has to prone when the wave gets too crowded. Sue watched as Rick finally got a wave to himself. Around four o'clock, the waves began to play tricks. The current shifted a little more to the north and is hitting the main reef full bore. Frenchie's been practicing hard on his pipe board, but why am I a bay is something else. Jeff Hackman is making his debut on one of the most radical waves of the day. The offshore wind and spray added an air of mystery to the ever-growing, shifting surf. The surfer could use a little radar or a good set of water wings. It's like being buried under a mountain of whipped cream or locked inside a giant bubble machine. Frenchie, forget about that pipo board. Outside, three surfers taking... No, it's only Greg Knoll driving. The bottom drops out and Greg takes a bad one. Wow. Uh-oh, another big one and KLO is bent out of shape. is getting out of control. There comes little Jeff and Sammy Lee on a giant wall and there's no way out. The crowd outside is thinning out as two surfers make the drop. <laughs> One drops all the way. In slow motion, here's a wipeout that really hurt. Ow! KLO of pearls, almost recovers, then goes down for the count. Watches Kalo is board again, Pearls, and sends him to the bottom. Then his board almost spears him. This thing started looking like a long-distance diving contest. The idea, of course, is to get as far away from the dangerous flying board as possible.
Mike staying high in the wave bounces out of control and bails out. Greg powers through, but Mike's loose board catches up and almost clobbers Greg. Here it comes. Flying boards can really hang you up. Complete with his clam diggers, swim fins, and his new pipo board, Frenchie decided to try YMA. Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Super Surfer. <laughs> Wayne Miata almost lost control. Wayne had a few kind words for Frenchie. They weren't long words, but they were kind. I mean, it's not every day you see a pipo board at the bay. <laughs> the jolting impact of each ride was like trying to ride a bucking Bronco bareback. Frenchie again screams down in front of Wayne and gave him a little spray. This time, Wayne really had some kind words for Frenchie, and Frenchie learned it isn't courteous to ace someone out, especially when that someone is a karate expert. Good rule to remember. Frenchie, Greg, and Rick were having the time of their lives. But Ricky got so stoked he almost drowned. Greg spotted a giant set building outside and scrambled out for the first wave. But now watch closely as the other surfer and board gets sucked backwards over the falls. Watch. There. Man, what a wipeout. That's how fast it can really happen. Greg looks out and sees Kale Ole, one of the few Hawaiian locals to ride the bay, finally master the steep drop, only to lose his speed and get caught in the soup. Paul Gabauer and Ricky share a wave. As it grew later, it also got much less crowded as the bigger grinding waves were taking their toll. The bay had reached almost 30 feet, and Rick and Greg practically had it to themselves. It's hard to believe anyone can be so casual and even happy in surf this size. It's no wonder Rick and Greg are considered the two top cats in big surf. They're both unbelievable. up and saw Peter Cole come tumbling head over heels down the thundering wall, almost crashing right on top of him. Wow, that was close. Then Rick looked outside and saw probably the largest wave ever ridden. Greg and Stang are fighting with all their strength this thundering mountainous wave. Stang is side slipping and losing speed. The whole mountain explodes, burying Stang alive. Unbelievable. Greg, high in the wave, makes it and lets out a yell you could hear all the way to Tokyo. Never had the bay been more dramatic or its surfers shown more courage. Ricky Grig here shows more class and style than a Russian ballerina. Surfing has come a long way from the ancient days of native chief Paki and his 160-pound koa log. Three surfers streaking into what looks like a black funnel of death. Sammy Lee tries to prone through the exploding fury, but it was Greg's wave. Rusty Miller came in, and so did Paul Gabauer. But still outside, high atop a peak and flirting with death, Greg wrangles out of this giant. Then Stang, Mike Stang, got the largest and most terrible wipeout ever recorded. In slow motion, here it is. Made it in through the channel. Kid Horn has found a short board in the channel. Whoever lost it may be in trouble. Somewhere out there, someone is in trouble. There, in the middle of the bay, it looks like someone. Across the bay, that deceptively beautiful fireball is forcing the struggling surfer toward the jagged rocks. Someone said it's Frenchy. It's impossible to get to him, wherever it is. A rescue in this treacherous surf is virtually impossible. Ricky is trapped outside himself. It was on a late, fiery afternoon like this that a big wave rider named Cross lost his life, right off the point. There goes Rick. Maybe he can get through to Frenchie in time. No, impossible. Fuzzy Trent was so right when he described YMA as the surfer's moment of truth. Fortunately, Rick is a fantastic swimmer, but Frenchie doesn't have Rick's stamina or experience. Look, he made it. And he's driving all the way across the bay to help Frenchie. Inside, someone is paddling frantically toward Frenchie. 
Looks like Stang and Greg. Man, hurry up and get out of there before another set comes. Yeah, that's definitely Frenchy. I can see his swim fins now. Greg and Stang are giving it their best, but the rip is rough. There's an ancient Hawaiian proverb that says, never turn your back on the sea. Now I know what it means. bigger surf and even bigger men to meet the challenge. But this is one safari many of us will remember for the rest of our lives. There are many beautiful moments the surfers share, but there are some things man must face alone. <laughs> you believe it? Uh-oh, Frenchie dropped his blanket. But wonderful Wanda grabs it. Figures she may need it. 